Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Al-Fatih nama uglik wal khatim nama sabaq. Nasir al-haq bil-haq. Al-hadi ila sirata qa mustaqim. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi haqa qadrihi wa min qadarihi al-azim. Alhamdulillah. We're continuing on. We're on page 25. Uh, the first paragraph down in this blessed book. On the topic of da'wah, of calling people to Islam. So he mentions here, he says, وَالَّذِي يَقِرُّ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ يَسْمَعُهُ وَالْحَقْوَ يَرَاهُ وَيَوْمَ الْجَمْعِ يَوْمَ الْجَمْعِ سَيَظْحَرُ هَذَا الَّذِي يَسْتَقِرُّ فِي بُوَاطِنِنَا وَتَحْصُلُ مِنْهُ بَعْدُ مَعَانِ الْمُقَابَلَةِ وَالْمُوَاجِهَةِ So he's saying that, he's talking here about the concept of muraqaba, the concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the idea or the reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of our innermost secrets. He, he's aware, aware of our thoughts and, and, and what we're pondering on or what we're thinking about. Now this, of course, is, a, this is an essential attribute for both the Muslim and also for the caller to God. And one of the, the, the secrets to mention about Surah Luqman. Surah Luqman is um, a chapter in the Quran that teaches us how to rear children. And it teaches us how to establish education with children. What do we teach children? What are the priorities? And by extension, it also teaches us what we should know ourselves. What are our priorities? What should we be learning first and foremost? So what should we teach our children? What should we teach those who are, who are we'll, who we're teaching, who we're looking after? And what should we be learning ourselves? So the very first point, as mentioned in Surah al is Tawheed, is to believe in the oneness of Allah. And then the second point that's mentioned that he tells his son, Sayyidina Luqman tells his son, that he tells him that there's nothing that's hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the point, the second lesson of life, the second lesson of Islamic education, you can say, is what's called muraqaba, the idea or the, the awareness, the permanent awareness that God is watching you on what you do. This awareness is, has to be established and has to be inculcated within the heart. Yeah, so this takes um, you know, training, tra training and effort to be able to inculcate the awareness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you at all times. So they mentioned here, so this way they say, whatever is established within your heart, Allah hears it, al-haq, the truth, he hears it and he sees it. And on the day when we all be gathered, he will manifest it. Yeah, he, 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 will, he will manifest that which was established within ourselves. SubhanAllah. But this is like Imam al-Awza'i in his famous statement. Imam al-Awza'i, one of the early ulama uh, from the Salaf, he said that um, on the Yom Al-Qiyamah, our lives will be played out sa'a bi sa'a, moment by moment. And one of our teachers, he says this means like um, frame by frame. It's like an analogy of like a, like a film or a movie, that the whole of your life will be played out moment by, by, by moment, and you're going to be questioned about it. And that aspect really is something that, reflecting upon that, allows us to become people of muraqaba. So when we're doing an action and we feel, and we feel riya, we feel ostentation coming in, or we feel some type of arrogance coming in, we should remind ourselves that these actions are for Allah. And that these actions will be, will be questionable. We'll be questioned about them. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us, the, the action will be shown, and why did you do this? Why did you do that? So these questions will be shown and we will be questioned and we will be asked about them. So therefore, when we reflect upon that, it will bring us in to a state of desiring Allah alone and focusing back just, I want to do this just for Allah. Because any other motive is going to be exposed. Any other motive is going to be shown. And we want to, on that day, we want to be safe from that. And we want to be people who are purely just doing things, longing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, longing for this meeting with Allah. But this awareness, which we met, mentioned before, is, is cultivated through things like the fakr meditation, and through reflecting in a deep way upon our own weaknesses, yeah, muhasaba, looking at our own selves, and then also by really entering into a presence in terms of, in terms of our dhikr, so that we're remembering Allah as if we see him, we're remembering Allah as if we see him, as if we, as if we are speaking to him directly. There's an intimate munajat, there's an intimate conversation going on. We are speaking directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So when you when you when you are calling upon him, you speak it directly to him. And who are you speaking to? The Rabbul Alami, the Lord of the entire universe. That should create a sense of like a sense of like tremendousness within our heart. Like there's something amazing going on here. We, we, are, we are able to speak directly to the Rabbul Nas, to the Lord of all of creation. Yeah, so when you have that, when you have the fact that you are seeing Allah, this creates intimacy and love and a yearning to be, to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of these types of actions create within the heart, it really to establish, actually establish firmly with, 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 within the heart a desire to be aware of Allah and that that then permeates. We have, the, we have this concept of the model of what's called mindfulness. Um, and I guess you could say that uh, mindfulness is possibly an interpretation of muraqaba. It's one of the terms we could use to try to shed light on what muraqaba is. But, so muraqaba is that, that having that permanent self-awareness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gazing upon you. And like we said, is gazing upon you out of love and concern and care. That he's, he's guarding you and he's looking out for you. So that should make it give us immense strength. Etern internal strength. And we see with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had immense eternal strength. When he's in the cave, when he's in the cave, what does he say? He says to Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr Siddiq, what do you think about somebody, yeah, like when, like me and you, and then Allah is with us as well. The third one with us is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now, why should I worry about the fact that there's people outside this cave about to try to kill me when Allah is with me? Like they mentioned the man, what's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's asleep. He's taking a nap under a tree and he's hung his sword up next to, next to the tree. So a, a, a man sees an opportune moment. One of the enemies of Islam, he sees an opportune moment to go and assassinate the Prophet Sallallahu So he says, he's asleep. This is my chance. So he goes, he creeps up, he picks up the sword and he raises the sword like this. And then as he does that, the Prophet Sallallahu opens his eyes. Now we know the Prophet Sallallahu didn't sleep. He said that the eye sees where the heart doesn't sleep. The heart remained conscious of Allah at all times. So he, when he raises the sword, he opens his eyes and, and the man says, who will save you from me now? Ya Muhammad And he says, Allah. And he says, Allah, in such a powerful way, the man shakes and drops the sword. And then the Prophet picks up the sword and says, who will save you from me now? And then he's like, go easy on me. And it's interesting, actually, some of the legal scholars, they point out that he actually says to him at that point, he says that I won't fight you. Yeah, I won't, I, I won't fight, fight the Muslims if you let me go. And the Prophet sort of lets him go on that basis, which is a precedent for us legally, that if somebody isn't fighting you, then, you know, mashallah. Yeah, so because he wasn't going to fight the Muslims directly, is then was, it, it, was, it became a different type of context. And the Prophet sort of forgave him, even though he's about to take his life. Yeah, so that type of awareness that Allah is watching and Allah is guarding you and that you have nothing to be wor worried about. The Prophet ﷺ would walk openly in the streets and in crowds without any kind type of God, with any type of bodyguard or anything like that because he had absolute confidence that his Lord would look after him and his, his, his Lord would protect him. So we ask Allah for that type of tawfiq, to have that type of safety and security in everything we do, that we recognize that success is from Allah and whatever we given, whatever we given is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to try to be aware of him. They say that, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ told us that Ihsan, spiritual excellence, is to worship Allah as if you see him. And if you don't see him, know that he sees you, which is muraqaba. So number one is what they call mushahada, or shuhud, that you are worshipping Allah as if you see him all the time. You permanently, instead of seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time, or... The, the second rank is a knowledge, a permanent knowledge that he is seeing you, that he is aware of you and he knows exactly what's thinking and he's scrutinizing what's, what, what, what's, what's going on within you. But he only desires, he only loves and wants good for you. And he only wants to see come forth from your, from your heart that which is beautiful and that which is, which is wondrous. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want, wants from us. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this beautiful religion to be able to do. Okay, so he says, and then he goes on, then he says, فَمَاذَا تَلْوُونَ فِي بَاقِي عَمَالِكُمْ الَّتِي تُقَدُّونَ هَالَا ظَهْرِ هَذِي الْأَرْضِ So this is now a question for us to, to contemplate. What are we going to attend? Yeah, we, we're living right now. So for the rest of our lives, our lives that remain, what are we going to attend, intend to do 
in the time that we remain upon the, the face of this earth? What is our intention going to be? What is it that, that, that we want to do? Mada tanhuna fiha. Yeah, what do we intend to do in that time? Tantabihuna insha'Allah wa tastaqimuna wa tajtahiduna wa tabdhuluna al-fikra kullahu wal-umra kullahu wal-wus'a kullahu wal-hala kullahu. Yeah, so he says, become aware and become firm, steadfast, and struggle and expend all of your energies, all of your thoughts, all of your life, everything that you have, your internal state, expend all of that in what? In serving the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in spreading this religion. This is really a call to action, a call to establishing this within our lives yeah, and to having a firm niyyah. And the niya, the intention is really a, a mysterious thing because we don't know what, we, what we're intending. We don't actually know whether our intention was sincere or not. Only Allah knows. Only Allah, it's, a, it's part of the sir. It's part of the secret of the human being because intention is what we are judged on. That's what we are judged on. We are, because Allah created us and what we do. So we are judged on why we did it. That's the great question that we're going to be asked, all of us. What did you do for my sake? Yeah. What did you do? So first thing is, what actions did you do? Okay, I did this, I prayed, I read Quran, etc. For my sake, for me, this is the question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're all going to be asked. What did you do for my sake, for me? So when you say, what did you do for my sake? That's being asked about intentions. And what is going on within the, re the deep recesses of the heart. So the intention is something that's profound. It needs to be protected. Now they mentioned there's external factors. And there's internal factors that impact our intention. So we go into an action with the reason to do it for Allah alone. And then whilst we're doing the action, things can change it. We can have external factors. Those are things out of our control that are outside of us. That can affect our intention. So, for example, they make they make the the example of a teacher teaching a class, and they say suddenly he gets a lot of students. Or suddenly students start to leave, whichever way, yeah. And that change in the number of students affects his attention in intention. That's a sign that the intention was insincere. Because if he's doing it for just to see Allah and just to be with Allah and just to please Allah and just to love Allah and to yearn to be closer to Allah then he wouldn't really be looking at how many people have come, how many people have not come. So these are external factors. Then we have internal factors, like what's going on within, within us, our own issues that we have, for example, our own hassle for others, our own desire to please others, our own desire to have a position amongst others. All these types of things, all of them affect our intention and therefore we need to guard ourselves from this. Because this is the lub, the secret, the essence of everything that we're going to take forward to Allah is in our intention. And this is why Imam al-Junaid, the great Imam al-Junaid said that one sincere intention, one sincere intention opens 70 gateways of tawfiq. So one sincere intention opens 70 gateways of divine success, of providence, of success from Allah. Just one, one sincere intention. So it's a tremendous thing to intend for the sake of Allah is amazing. This is why Imam Ali, he said that if I knew that even one of my deeds had been accepted, if I knew, knew even one single deed of mine had been accepted, I would fly out of ecstasy. I would be overjoyed because we have no guarantee anything's been accepted. So therefore, when we find out, mashallah, yeah, this is something that, that pleases us. So how then do we, do we assure our deeds are accepted? We do them with love. Like they say, mountains and mountains of deeds devoid of love are not equal to one atom's weight of, of a deed done with, with love, a desire to be with Allah. This is the, the key to, to our intention. And it is, it's an incremental thing. It does take time. One of the great imams, Imam Ibn Ali Jamra, anhu, he said that um, he struggled with his intention for, for 20 years. And he said, I found nothing. I found no struggle in life, no jihad, no struggle no striving, nothing more difficult, yeah? He said, I found nothing more difficult in my life than preserving my intention. I found nothing more difficult than keeping focus in my intention, than staying sincere and strong in my intention. 
So this, and this is one of the great arifin, one of the great knows, one of the great Gnostics of Allah. So therefore it is a difficult thing. And it, it takes time and it takes increment, incremental practice to be in a state where we're constantly aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we're doing things for him alone. Yeah, and this is inshallah the, the, the challenge for us. So inshallah ta'ala, we set out on this journey to, to arrive there and we will, by the tawfiq of Allah inshallah ta'ala, we will arrive there. Okay, now we go to the next sec section, which is Fadl haq alayna bi tawfiqihi lana li sum'il tafkiri bihi. So now he's talking about Allah preferring, yeah, the preference of Allah for us. Allah preferring us by granting us success, by allowing us to listen to being reminded of him. The fact that we are able to listen to the reminder is a sign of success. So what does he say here? So قَدْ رَضِيطَ عَنْهُ وَنَفَعْنَا بِكْ مِنْ نِعْمَةِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْنَا أَنَّ تَذْكِيرَ بِهِ يُرْسِلُهُ إِلَيْكَ الْحَقُّ عَلَى لِسَانِ مَخْلُوقْ وَتَسْمَهُ وَتَقْرَهُ فِي كِتَابٍ وَتَنْظُرُوا إِلَيْهِ بِأَيِّ وَسِيلًا الله أكبر From the greatest blessings of Allah yeah, And the blessings of Allah as we know are profound and never ending yeah, The blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This is what, when we sing shuhud, shuhudu ni'am When we are witnessing the blessings of Allah That's a state What's, that, what's the greatest state? Shuhudu mun'im To see Allah you don't even see the blessing, you just see Allah. So Allah, so someone brings food before you, you don't even see the food, you just see Allah. That Allah has given you that food. Yeah, somebody gives you any type of goodness within your life, any type of barakah, and you just see Allah, you don't see it, you don't see anything. This is what we mean by so From amongst these great these blessings is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set down guidance for us through the, the, the tongues of prophets. And maybe, maybe we, we won't really understand that, apart from those of us who were once misguided, who once didn't have guidance in our lives. Because really to have guidance is a great blessing that people often might take for granted. But ask those who have no guidance, who are seeking paths and are trying to find some type of peace and happiness in their lives and some type of sakina and some type of waqar. Ask them what it means to be guided, what it means to have guidance. Yeah, it's a great, great blessing. But haqiqa and al haqqa subhanahu wa ta'ala hu wa ladhi da'a khalqahu ilayh. The reality is, is that God is the one who calls people to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who calls creation to him, his creation to him. Thumma fil alam al khalqi ja'ala da'i lana nabiyahu Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says, this is very important. He says the reality, the reality is that Allah calls people to, to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls people to him. That's the reality. But Allah has made it that he has, he has, in this created world, in this world that we are in, this dunya, he has made the Prophet ﷺ the absolute caller, the caller to him. Allah has put, placed within the blessed heart of the Prophet ﷺ all of the secrets of calling people to Islam. All of that. He has become the caller, the da'yan ilallah bi'idhnihi. Yeah, he is the caller with absolute permission to call people to, to Allah. He is the one. And what are we then? So therefore, all we are is just a piece. Yeah, just a piece of his da'wah. Our tongues are just a piece from his tongue. The tongue of the Prophet Sallallahu which is the tongue. That's why when we call people to Islam, we are simply calling people to him. That's all we're doing. Really, we are calling people to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That's it. That's, that, that's what we, no matter who it is and, 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 and what context, we, because it's universal. So for example, when we go to, when we engage with children, when we go to schools, we ask our teacher, our teacher Sheikh Omar Hussain Al-Khatib, we visit schools and we talk about Islam. What should we teach them? What should we do? He said, call them to Muhammad Sallallahu Just call them to the Prophet Sallallahu Whether we looking at the disenfranchised, the weak within society, which is who the Prophet cared about the most, we call them to the prophetic example. Whether we're calling the, the affluent, whether we're calling the working class, whether we're calling our immediate friends and, and family, whoever we're calling, we point them to that. Yeah, through number one, we point them through talking about him, through teaching people about him. 
Number two, through embodiment. We embody his character traits and through embodiment, we, 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 now, we now call people. Yeah, I, I remember the Fakir a few months ago, we were sat with um, Habib Hashim for the whole lot. I'm talking about, about this issue of da'wah, calling people to Islam. And he says, really, it takes people of great charisma. And it takes people of great character. And he said, make dua to Allah that he places these character traits in your heart. He said, this is what you should hope that these sifat, these qualities, prophetic qualities, those traits enter within you yeah so those traits really need to become mixed within us a, a part of us and once that happens then mashallah ta'ala we're able to to go out and, and impact others and this is why our call needs to be directed towards him so we need to tell the world about muhammad we need to tell the world about his miraculous nature this is why one of the, the ways that we, we are going to prove the truth is through him. Because if you look at the miracles of the, of the Prophet they're beyond comprehension. And they exist to this day. So I'll just give you one example of his miracle. Just one example, just his name. His name is what? Muhammad. What does Muhammad mean, وسلم, linguistically? So we have the, the root of his Hamida, which means to praise. Yeah? Hamada means to praise extensively yeah and then muhammad muhammad means the one who praises extensively yeah muhammad is the one who is praised the one who is praised extensively and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's amazing we look at that name there was no one before him sallallahu alaihi who was given that name it was a very unique name and they asked abu muqalib now, why is it that you've given him that name, his, his, his grandfather? And he said, because I hope that he'll be praised. Yeah, I hope that he'll be And there's no one now in, in human history up until this day who has been praised anywhere near the same extent as the Prophet ﷺ. That we have millions and millions and millions of poems in his praise and, and in his honor. Yeah, the art form of po Muslim poetry is the highest art form. This is what we teach that Sheikh Abdul Kim Muradi mentions that the Muslims, he says, they excelled in calligraphy. So we find, for example, Quran, one of the Qurans that was, he mentions that was commissioned by the, during the Mongol period. He says that non-Muslims, non-Muslim art historians say this is the most beautiful book ever written. So he talks about that. Then he says, look at architecture. Again, he says, non-Muslim art historians will say that the Dome of the Rock is the most beautiful building ever constructed. Or they say the Taj Mahal, or they say the Alhambra, yeah? So the Muslims excelled in these things. He says, but the greatest art the Muslims excelled in was poetry. This was the supreme art of the Muslims. And if you look at poetry, he says 90%, 90% of poetry is praise of the chosen one, sallallahu So look at that, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. The Adhan, we hear Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam all over the a quarter of the world. There's never a moment that goes by except that he's being mentioned. Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in all contexts, in all ways. How is that? Yeah, and his praise goes on. I mean, you just look at the amount of biographies, Sira, yeah, Shema'il, Qasais, the Dala'il al-Nubuwa. Look at the amount of books hundreds of thousands, even millions of books written upon this blessed prophetic personality because he's praised more than anyone else, whether it's poetry, whether it's prose. How is that? This is an individual, so if you look at him outwardly, he was born in the seventh century in Arabia in an area that was the darkest place in the world at the time. There's no civilization. He had no access to learning. He had no access to anything that, that we would consider to be knowledge and that we would consider to be a like, civilization. And yet, look at, look at what he produced. Look at the civilization that he produced. Look at his achievements. These are all miracles. We can go on and on, inshallah, the fakir, we're hoping to do just a separate course on this topic, on what we're going to entitle the first proof of Islam, and looking at the, the, the Prophet, some 20, 25 different points on why the Prophet, sallallahu is the representative of the truth. Yeah, so this is one aspect of which we call people through these examples, that look at the Prophet's liberation of women. 
The Prophet says, if you look at the time of the Sahaba, and we have these statistics right now, you look at the early biographies where they mention all of the great scholars of that era, of the, the great people. They say 13%, 13% of the scholars of that time, like the, the ones that were teaching in the masajid and in the houses, 13% were women. Now, if you look now, you look at modern day, look at this, the West, America, the UK, the West, how many full-time university professors do you get that are women? They estimate between six to seven percent. So at the time of the Prophet we had twice as many, twice as many female scholars as we have now in, in, the, in the, the Muslim scholars as we have in the, in the West. That's one point. The other point is look at the context, look at what's going on in the world, and how are women being treated. In Europe it takes 1,300 years for women to have the right to own their own property. The Prophet obviously gave them that at the time. Yeah, it takes them. Look at what the what the suffragettes have to go through to get the vote, to have a voice. And then you compare that to that to say that Aisha anha, who is leading armies into battle, and who is the greatest teacher amongst the Sahaba Qat. They say she has more students. Say that Aisha anha has more students than all of the other Sahaba combined. 123,999 or more than that, 159,999, whatever opinion you're going to go on. All of them, put them all together, their, their number of students are, don't equal the same as the number of students said than Aisha. I mean, that's un, it's unheard of. There's no precedent historically prior to that of there being female scholars anywhere on the face of the planet. You can go all over the world, there's, there's nothing there. So where did that come from? Where did the elevation of the weak and the downtrodden come from? Where did a methodology come from, a spiritual methodology that has been proven over 1,400 years to produce results, to allow people to experience and be with Allah, to allow people to transform the inner reality time and time again. We have thousands, hundreds of thousands of scholars and saints in this ummah who have documented. Yeah, this, is like, this is now like a scientific study of 1,400 years. People who have undergone certain spiritual training and they've arrived at results so we can say this is proven qat'an yeah that they have done these things and they have arrived at certain results where they've attained spiritual states yeah so this is all part, part of the prophetic legacy and there's, there's obviously a lot more that, that we could talk about his universal message we could talk about many many different dimensions to him and these all point to the truth of the prophet so he's the da'i he's calling we just call people to him and by doing that, we call people to humanity. First and foremost, his character. This is one we asked when, when we got advice from Habib Umar about this paper. So we said, how do we, how do we present the Prophet ﷺ to the world, particularly to non-Muslims and to atheists? And Habib said, do it through pointing to his humanity, his tremendous character traits, his forgiveness, his generosity, his courage. Point to those aspects, and through that is the great gateway. And the best way to do that, not as embodiment, we embody that, that ourselves, and then we, we become that. But we can also mention these things, that Fat Mecca, these are unprecedented historical um, moments, they really are. There's no historical comparison to somebody absolutely forgiving his enemies after 20 years of oppression, where these same people, they, they murdered his uncle, yeah, they, and they, they chewed the, the liver of his uncle, they killed his wife. Yeah, the types of things they tried to assassinate him 13 times in his life all of this and he just forgives them in, in one fell so this is unheard of it's unparalleled there's no historical president whatsoever the historical president is to go in and to massacre everybody when you come he entered mecca with 10,000 people the largest army arabia had ever seen 10,000 um, men and as we mentioned previously that army was diverting course because he didn't want to disturb a litter of dogs the Prophet also had such concern for animals that he didn't want to disturb this group of dogs. So he said, let's move the whole army around. Yeah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the mercy, this is the, the gentleness of the, the Prophet that we need to show to the world, inshallah. And when we show that to the world, then inshallah, they'll see beauty and they'll, it'll give them a sense of, of closeness to the one who we close to, sallallahu Inshallah. Okay, we'll, we'll stop there. Inshallah, if there's any questions, Inshallah, please um, put in the chat box so you can unmute your, unmute your mic and ask as well, Inshallah. Um, there's a question here. When that question happens, will that be in front of Allah SWT on, only or also in front of all the creation? 
So what the ulama mentioned is that this will be in front of all of creation. So what happens is that the, the questioning takes place in front of the professor, professor so, so, so in front of everybody. Now, obviously, the, this is the point of Toba, like we were talking about the evening classes. Toba, to give an example, like the, if you can't with the movie example, Toba is an editing reel. So you've got your whole life, this long film that's being played out. Now, the bits that you made Toba from sincerely are removed. Yeah, if you are really profound in your Toba, you don't even have a hisab. That's why they say just to have a reckoning is a punishment. Yeah, just to have a reckoning is a punishment. So therefore, you ask to enter Jannah bila hisab, wala itab. You ask without. This is why you see many, many of the pious, the morning time, Fajr and then after Maghrib, they make this dua to enter into Jannah without hisab. And if you're making that dua every day, then mashallah, we have, we have good hopes in Allah. Okay, so now please can you define muraqaba? Sorry, Mr. Can you recommend a, okay? So a couple of questions here. So the second one, can you recommend a serial book in English? There's there's only one serial book in English, really, that's head and shoulders above all the others, which is the one by Martin Links, just called Muhammad Sallallahu his life from the earlier sources, I think. That book is really mashallah. I mean, the I, I, I read it again recently, just when, when I was in Tareem, and it's it's absolutely amazing. Really, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, like each page there's like two or three stories in the two three gems that are just blow you away now obviously there's one or two points in there that, that aren't correct but i mean you know the, what book is it that is perfect other than the other than the quran so there is a couple of things in there and um, that that aren't accurate but you know two things out of a, a masterpiece really much and the way it's been written and everything is just mashallah it's absolutely amazing so i would recommend that the muraqa so muraqa but we could say is that watchfulness it's having a sense that God is watching you, yeah? that, God, that God is watching you and that God is aware of you and is aware of what's going on in your inner state. And like we said, that doesn't have to be seen as a negative thing. It's not, a neg it's not like God's watching you to make a mistake. Or God, it's actually that God's watching, God's looking out for you. God God's, has his watchful eye over you to, to look after you and to guide you. Yeah? So it has that aspect to it. And it also has the aspect of then taking our internal life seriously because what's internal is more important than what's external. Allah is gazing upon our end. So this is what they say, sincerity, sidq is that it's equal. At the very least, our outward should be the same, same as our inward. But really, our inward should be better than our outward. So what we're showing to the world, yeah, our outward practice of Islam, what's inside us should be much sweeter and much better and much stronger than, than that. that that's, that's, the, 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 that's, that's the point of muraqaba and that's why we should attempt to become people of Muraqaba so that we can become in, in, internally purified, inshallah. Uh, Barakulafi, is there any other questions? Okay, inshallah, we'll stop there.